Hey, it's Steve. Today is day 11 of my 30 days of video series and also water fasting at the same time. It's such a beautiful spring day out, 73 degrees right now, so I thought I'd do this one outside. Um, quick update on the fast, it's going well. Boy, my energy is just rebounding tremendously now. Um, hard to believe I haven't eaten anything in over 10 days now. Um, I'm just feeling like, not just like good mentally and emotionally, but also physically. I feel like I could, you know, I have enough energy. I could go for a run now if I wanted to. Uh, that's really nice instead of being so sluggish all the time. Um, you know, like it's been last week was, was pretty rough some days, but uh, yeah, now it's on the upswing. I saw the same pattern with my previous fast last year, right around this time, right around this point in the fast. I think it's just like the first several days of the fast, uh, your body's doing a lot of heavier detox and it seems to lighten up after a bit. So that's, that's really nice. I'm glad to be in this phase. I feel like I could get a lot of work done. I got a bunch of work done this morning, so I'm finally starting to move some, you know, some actual work forward. That part is really, really nice. So I'm really glad for that. Um, I, would, um, I would say the main topic um, I wanna to talk about today is, has to do with your social circle and particularly improving your social circle. A few people asked me about that, like some ideas about this and how we could um, Im you know, improve our social circles. Um, so this is particularly important because people have a huge effect on your overall lifestyle enjoyment. You know, the social aspect of your lifestyle is a really big deal. Um, people often see their lifestyle in isolation as something they do on their own, like their hobbies and their experiences and their adventures and combined with their work and their career path and their contribution. But I really think as I, you know, as I shared in some previous videos, it makes a lot of sense to focus on the people aspect um, as really your primary source of happiness and fulfillment. You know, the people you serve, the people you have as friends, the people you connect with, the people you learn from, uh, the people who learn from you, that is such a big part of lifestyle design. And we tend to overlook that quite a bit, or we tend to downplay it, or think it's just some kind of after effect that happens by itself. And that's usually not the case. It is something that I think you need to put some deliberate effort into cultivating if you want your social circle to turn out really you know, strongly beneficial for you. Uh, another thing is like your social circle will have a huge impact on the results you get in life, especially the, you know, the people who are closest to you, the people who are influencing you each day or each week, the people you're learning from constantly. Um, I tend to hang out with a lot of other entrepreneurs, especially people who live fascinating lifestyles, um, who've developed their courage in many ways. And you know, I get a lot of inspiration from my friends, from other people I know. So many ideas just come to me through other people. Uh, and it's just, it's just tremendous. If I didn't have my social circle, I think my lifestyle would really suck. Um, so I wanna, I wanna spend most of this video just sharing some tips and ideas for how to create a really strong social circle that you feel is you, that you feel like, hey, this is your tribe. You know, this is something that matters to you and you like these people and they're inspiring to you and they're uplifting you and you're not just alone. And I, I know this is a, is a particularly strong interest for people in my audience because years ago when we had discussion forums um, on my website between 2006 and 2011, at one point I surveyed all the forum visitors and I asked them, I said, out of curiosity, how many friends do you have right now in your life that you would say are into personal growth? And 40% of the people, we got a lot of replies, but 40% of the people said zero. And another, I think 20% said just one. And then the top category was like 10 or more, and that was like 8%. So there, you know, most people just had zero or one friend that's into personal growth, even though that was a big interest for them, um, especially since they were actively participating in the forums. And I thought, wow, that's, uh, that's for one, that's really surprising to me, but I could understand why, why it's so. A lot of people I think were drawn to my blog or to my work because that was their main outlet for personal growth. For many of these people for years, it's been their main outlet for personal growth is just um, you know, trying to connect th um, through, that, uh, through my website. And what I've seen from people going to my workshops uh, in Vegas is that they connect really well, but many of them don't have these kinds of connections outside that environment. It's not, it's not normal for them. And you know, I have to admit, um, I'm a bit out of touch with that because so for so many years, you know, I've, I, my, I mean, the number of friends I have that are into personal growth are in the triple digits. <laughs> um, 
but I can remember back when I was in my early 20s and I was just getting started on this path and getting into personal growth myself where I didn't know anybody was into it. And then of course you get ribbed for like, oh, you're one of those self-help people and you know, they make fun of you for that. And then you meet people who really do take it seriously and they're getting strong results from it and that opens up a whole new world for you, especially validating that yes, you are indeed on the right path. So I'll tell you, you know, first of all, yes, you are on the right path because your social life can be amazing when you fill it with an enrichment of, of friends who are into personal growth and you know who, who are like-minded and like-spirited and like-hearted. Uh, so definitely don't give up. Uh, even if you're all alone, even if you're one of those 40% who is just you know the only person you know who's into conscious growth, um, that's okay. Like a lot of us start at that place. I started at the place, it's, it's quite normal. But yeah, you can get to the point where you, you know, the number of friends you have are in the triple digits and you have you know, friends all over the world, friends in your hometown that you can connect with whenever you want and have you know, deep and interesting personal growth conversations, people who send you resources and ideas that are constantly helping you, people who are living cool and interesting lifestyles themselves where they're you know, focused on you know, a fulfilling purpose that means something to them and they have lots of different interests that you can, they can share with you. Uh, you get, you know, you can get invited to all kinds of things through my friendship network. I get invited to all kinds of interesting things. Uh, so it, it's, uh, in a way, because of the nature of my work, it's allowed me to come become a little social, uh, a little more socially lazy, and still have a really rich and abundant social life. So that I think is an awesome place to be. And if I actually put more effort into it, I would probably make it even better. But it's like so good right now. It's just like I, I often feel like I don't need to make the effort. Um, so I want to give you some tips on how to get to that point. First, first tip. Um, I would suggest making two lists. So they're, they're simple lists, you can just brainstorm these in a few minutes, but basically lists of qualities and values um, you would, number one, want in a friend, and number two, not want in a friend. Um, so, you know, things I would have on my list would be things like, okay, I want friends who are honest. Um, they, I want people who are intelligent and have some depth to them. People who have broad interests, not just entirely mono-focused, like not the tech person who's just like all they know is tech and they've never explored anything else in life. Um, that Those conversations tend to be very limiting unless you want to talk about technology all the time. Um, I like people who are caring, compassionate, people with a global perspective, not nationalist, so they, they care about the world, they want to think, you know, they have, have a sense of oneness to their lives. Um, People with a good sense of humor. I love joking and playing around. So people who are playful and can be fun and lighthearted and can take and handle my sense of humor, that's pretty important. Um, action takers. People who have some courage and are willing to face their fears and move towards them. Not the kinds of people where it seems like their life is just shrinking inwards, but the ones who are like willing to push themselves to, to tackle new and interesting goals. Goal-oriented friends. That's another thing. It's like if I ask my friends what their goals are, they can tell me. Um, uh, you know, again, sense of purpose, uh, growth oriented. So, you know, that's pretty clear. So then, you know, that would be like on my first list. I mean, I can, I can go and, you know, elaborate on these qualities more. I'm just sharing this to give you a rough idea. And your list may, be, may, be, may be completely different. That's totally fine. This is what you want. What kind of friends would, you know, think, what kind of friends would really help you grow? What would, would inspire you? Um, and, you know, for the opposite list, then, you, you know, for the no list, what you don't want, then, it's pretty much pretty easy to create, you know, just the opposite of your first list. I do think it's helpful to list these things out specifically, you know, so it's like people who are racist, nationalist. Um, uh, I tend not to get along so well with people who are very religious just because uh, my, my whole lifestyle doesn't fit into their model. You know, like me being in an open relationship for seven years, that I get a lot of rejection and judgment from such people with very few exceptions. There are some exceptions, so I wouldn't automatically rule someone out on that basis, but it tends to be a pattern that those people just don't like me. <laughs> um, so I don't tend to dig you know, too far into trying to make friendships with them. Looks like we have a cement truck just driving down the street, passing by in a moment. So it'll get a little quieter in just a minute. <laughs> um, okay. All right, so you got these, two lists. Now what do you do? Well, the next step is to start shamelessly expressing these values through like all your public channels. Stop wearing that mask that is trying to be um, a match for everybody. 
and realize that you have to have more of a ones and tens model. And the ones and tens model means that if you want to be a 10 for somebody, you have to risk being a one for somebody else. I mean, on a scale of one to 10. So in other words, to get people to really like you and love you and know you as you are, you've got to be willing for people to absolutely despise you <laughs> and loathe you. Um, you know, I get that a lot with religious people. They tend to hate my work, especially the, you know, the, the Catholics, the Christians, because I'm an ex-Catholic. And, um, you know, I'll get these long thousand word emails filled with Bible quotes telling me why I'm, you know, wrong and I'm doomed to hell and all that. And I'm like, okay, we're not really a match for each other. I get that. Uh, and those have toned down over the years because I just keep pushing back and eventually I turn those people off so much they don't even bother to go to my website anymore. Um, but. And that's, that's really the key, is that you want to express who you really are. You want to put out and express the qualities and the values, um, you know, sharing openly. Like if you're using social media, share that. If you're at um, even a, f a family event, like share who you are. <laughs> and um, if you write a blog or create a video, like don't hide that stuff about yourself. Share it. Flaunt it. The stuff that um, people tend to hide about themselves because they're worried about being judged for it is often the very thing that will create the best friendships and the best matches. Like me sharing, I'm vegan. Okay, like for some people, that's that's gonna automatically rule me out as being a good friend for them. But for others, they're like, boom, instant, like at least an eight. <laughs> um, and, I, and I see that with other people too. Like if somebody tells me they're vegan, it's like, boom, I've automatically elevated their status in my mind because I see like now we have a lot in common. And it's not just the vegan thing, it's the fact that by going vegan, they've probably had to do a lot of personal growth work along the way. They've had to handle um, going against society's expectations of them and going their own course. They're probably more health oriented. And there's like all this list of other things that tends to go along with it. Not every single time, but it definitely, you know, elevates them uh, in my mind. But if they were to hide that and I only found that out much later, I might not bother to invest as much in the friendship. And, and, you know, we might miss the chance to really connect. When I shared on my website that uh, Rochelle and I were getting into an open relationship, um, what was really interesting is I had a bunch of friends who were already in my social circle, and they emailed me and said, hey, I've been in an, op in an open relationship for years, and I'd love to talk more about this with you and give you some tips and advice. And I thought, what? Here comes that same truck again. Okay. Um, no idea why a cement truck just drove into my neighborhood and then drove back out again. <laughs> um, it's just a short per period of time. Uh, okay, so when I shared this and I found that other people already in my social circle were into open relationships and they were telling me about this and they're like, yeah, I've been in like a three-person relationship for many years. I'm thinking, seriously, what? How, you know, how is that the case? Um, how did I not, not know this about you before? And they said, well, I didn't know you'd be cool about it, you know, so I didn't tell you. I thought, oh, wow. So I had to be the first one to open up. Now, I understand there's some risk of judgment and stuff if you open up about the things about yourself that you've been keeping private all along. But the flip side of that is that the benefit is you'll get a lot more connections that are much more aligned with what you're really into and who you really are. And that is, I think, the real key to getting deep, you know, cool, intimate friendships. Uh, if you don't do that, if you hold back, you're, you're missing out a bit. Another thing is that if you don't share the, the, that more private stuff about yourself, even earlier in a conversation, um, people won't likely remember you as much. When you get in a conversation with somebody, like I was at a conference a few weeks ago, met lots of people there, um, and many of those people I'll just forget. Why? Because the stuff they told me was generic. You know, we just had very surface conversations. Um, but if um, if they told me something much more interesting about themselves, took some social risks by sharing certain things with me, I'm much more likely to remember them. As an interesting example of this, at the Conscious Relationships workshop that we did, I think it was in early 2012, um, we had, it was a fairly small workshop, we had about 28 people there, and one exercise we did right at the beginning of the workshop, before people had a chance to get to know each other, is we had everyone get up, introduce themselves for just a minute, one at a time. And their introduction was just like, you know, their name, and then basically to tell us one um, unusual thing about themselves. And, or one interesting thing about themselves they want to share. I'm not sure of the exact wording I used, but um, 
you know, we went around the room, and then afterwards, we immediately got in a circle, and each person took a, took a, took, uh, took a turn getting in the middle of the circle. And I had everybody rate on a scale of 1 to 10. Uh, they wrote on a scrap of paper. How, um, how much on a scale of 1 to 10 would you like to get to know this person better? Like, how attracted are you to this person? I'm not talking about romantically attracted, per se, but just like, would you like to get to know this person? Is it a friend or anything? You know, anything. Do you, uh, are you interested? Does this person, you know, what, what little you know about them, does, does it appeal to you? How much appeal is there on a scale of 1 to 10? And then the second thing I had them write was like, are they a male or female, you know, rating this? Um, and then uh, what was the... Um, oh, yeah. The, other, the third thing I had them write down was what was the interesting or unusual thing that this person shared to see if they could remember it. And what was interesting is a lot of people saw they were getting things like fives and sixes and sevens and some of them like nobody even remembered <laughs> the interesting or unusual thing about them. And we just shared this minutes earlier. Of course it was for 28 people so you have to remember a lot of, you know, a lot of these. But if minutes later, you know, if people are at a party or something or a conference and they're meeting lots of people and they can't even remember what unusual or interesting thing you shared, it means you've shared a dud. It means it's not something that surprises them and not something that's lodging in their memory. It probably just satisfies their existing patterns, something generic, and they just forgot you. And that kind of sucks, because if they don't remember you, how are they supposed to want to connect with you more? And if they're giving you a five, six, or seven, they're just seeing you like everybody else out there. They're just seeing you as like, yo, he's a, he or she is an okay person, but what am I supposed to do here? You know, it's like, there's, there's no real reason to connect deeply. People want to connect more deeply with their eights and nines and tens, not their fives and sixes and sevens. What was interesting is there was one guy at the workshop um, who got a bunch of ones and tens. If I recall, I think most of his were like ones and twos or nines and tens. And, uh, and I think everybody remembered, if not everybody, then really close to it, everybody remembered what his unusual thing was. And, uh, and it was that, you know, he said he likes tying women up, you know, like a bondage thing. And everybody remembered that. <laughs> and what was interesting is he, like, he was saying afterwards, he's like, who are these women who are giving me tens? I want to know who they are. I want to meet them. Um, so that was kind of, you know, that was kind of funny. It was very, very telling. And this is true in so many other areas of life. If you want to get those tens, you have to risk those ones. It's so often the case, you'll either get, you're either going to be in the middle because you're trying to share something safe, but safe is not exciting. It's not interesting to, to anybody, but it's also not repulsive. Uh, I encourage you in your social life to open up and share away from the middle. Go to the edges. That's going to be the thing that's more of a 10 for somebody and a one for somebody. Um, and that's, that's a really powerful part of creating a rich social life, is you've got to express more of the stuff you've been hiding, the things you're ashamed of, the stuff that makes you really who you are. Um, I've, you know, because I've shared this stuff about shoplifting in my past, this surprised me, but I've had some really fascinating connections with ex-thieves <laughs> or ex-criminals, you know, people who are in that phase two and they went past it. And what we have in common, the positive side of that, is it was a huge courage building experience for us. And so I often connect very deeply with those types of people. I can relate to that experience. I know what it's like to be inside a jail cell several times um, and how boring that is. <laughs> um, and we can share, you know, fascinating stories. And actually those are some of the most fun stories is when you share your criminal exploits back and forth. Even if you're not into that today anymore, and I'm honestly not into that anymore. Um, it's, you know, it creates a connection. It creates an, a, connect, a connection. But at the same time, of course, it's going to terribly turn other people off. They'll just be like, you are not my friend. I'm like, okay. But hey, if you don't like me now knowing that up front, then the benefit there is I've saved you time. I am not messing with you and making you invest in me only to find that out later and be disappointed in me. So I think you're doing people a favor when you share that riskier stuff up front because you're giving them a chance to reject you cleanly without wasting their time. And I, I think that is far more respectful than trying to be a match for everybody and playing it safe and only later unloading some of your baggage on them <laughs> and then hoping they stick around because of the sunk cost they've already made in investing in your relationship. I really don't think that's a fair way to socialize. Um, and, and, an, and, an, and an, uh, I would say also an extension of this idea, you know, so another, another thing you can do here, is notice who's not a match for you. Is notice, you know, with those two lists you have, 
especially your don't want list. Who is matching your don't want list that's already in your life? Now, you can tone down those relationships, just sort of let them fade a bit, like by not investing them in, anymore, in them anymore. What if it's a relationship that's really a big part of your life and you feel it's becoming a negative influence on you? You might have to actively disconnect. I have to do that very rarely. It's like once in several years that actually ever comes up. But, you know, it does happen now and then. And so, um, you know, one time, one time that happened, it was, uh, uh, you know, many years ago, like after college, and I had a friend who was really into software piracy. And I just decided I didn't want to be like into the whole piracy th scene. So um, I, I told him, you know, I'm so tempted to like pirate stuff because he's all offering me this pirated software and things like that. And I just thought, you know, it's just not a part of my life I want to have anymore. I, want, I was at a time where I was wanting to focus on being more honest and authentic and having higher integrity. And having this kind of friend in my life whose values were just out of alignment with mine, it was just not something I felt was a good influence on me. So I just told him, you know, we got we to gotta disconnect. And he was upset, but, and I understood that. Um, but I felt like a bit lighter afterwards. It was, um, it was not an easy decision to make, but I definitely felt like it was something I needed to do to move on from that type of experience. Um, what else? Another thing you can do is you can um, make invitations. And I usually just go by intuition here. So, you know, invite people to have a cup of coffee together or go out to dinner together or share a breakfast together and just get to know each other, get to spend more time together. And I'll often just be very direct with that. Say, you know, I think we have a lot in common. I'd love to get to know you better. Or if it's somebody I'm starting to get to know a bit better, I might even say, you know, I like you a lot. I'd love to spend more time with you and, and suggest something. You can do, um, you know, bigger invitations, like have a game night at your house or something like that. Uh, invite people over. But it's, you know, it's all about being proactive socially and not waiting so much for people to, to reach out and connect with you. Because if you do that, if you be too passive, people will often not notice that you're interested. People will often assume that you're disinterested if you're so passive. So it definitely helps a lot to build a social life if you're going to, you know, if you, if you want to build a social life, you need to be more proactive. I think that's really important. Um, take that risk, make the invitation. And the worst you get is a no. So what? You know, it's okay. Almost always though, if you're following your intuition, you know, you'll get, you'll get probably a positive response. That's almost always been the case for me. And if you don't, then you know, well, okay, I can drop that. I can let it go. And you won't start, you won't keep obsessing about it. It cleans your mind, keeps your mind clear to focus on other connections and other relationships. So if it's a no, it just means next, you know, move on to the next person. Um, another thing and an extension of this is don't just invite things directly, invite people directly, invite invitations. So by this, I mean, let people know what kinds of invitations you're open to receiving and um, share those publicly, like, you know, in your, uh, social media accounts or just by email with your friends uh, in your blog just share what kinds of invitations you're you're up for um, I like speaking invitations I like game night invitations when I'm traveling things like that and so you know if I want to have a more active social life I just might let my social circle know hey I'm looking to do more of such and such if you guys are into that let me know um, I haven't played tennis in many years so I might you know, might want to do more of that. I mean, there's all kinds of possibilities you can um, you can use to, to invite invitations. In other words, you know, let your social circle know that you're open to receiving certain invitations. So now they know that it's not a risk to invite you. They don't have to waste, you know, their worries about on, on getting rejected by you if they know what you're looking for. And you can even do this with sexual stuff too, if you want. You can say what kinds of experiences you want to have. Um, I've seen people actually get good results with that, just saying what they're open to experiencing. Um, another thing is like be active in seeking out clubs and groups and meetups and social, you know, um, social opportunities, conferences and things like that, where you think you're likely to find good matches. One of, one of the best decisions I made was in 2004 joining Toastmasters because through that I made so many local friends and um, met a lot of speakers, a lot of people with common interests and that is, you know, that was great. I was in it till 2010 and I'm still friends with with some of the people I met from Toastmasters uh, way back when. So that's that's been pretty cool, especially for making local friends. Um, any kind of local club you know you can find where it's a common interest thing, where you can go to especially weekly meetings. Monthly is a little iffy because you're just not seeing each other as much, but weekly is really good. I've gone to a bunch of other clubs and meetups and uh, they tend to be hit and miss. So don't get so attached to like 
making a perfect perfect match your first time. Uh, there's a meditation meetup group I occasionally go to on Sundays here in Vegas, and it's cool, but all we do is sit quietly and do a mindful mindfulness meditation. So there's not really much interaction with the other people there. It's not a very social experience. It's, I mean, meditating with others, that's cool, I like that, but it's not helping me make more friends who are into meditation, I would say. It would be cool if they had like an extra half hour afterwards or something where everybody socialized, but generally when the meditation's done, everybody gets up and leaves. Uh, maybe ask the instructor a few questions, that's about it. So, you know, again, it's, it's a bit hit and miss. You'll have to experiment here a lot. Meetup groups, uh, especially if you find some on meetup.com, they're all over the place in terms of their quality, in terms of the type of people they attract. Some I've been to and I'm just like, eh, this is creepy, I'm out of here. <laughs> Others I've been, oh, this is not so bad, I really like this. Um, I, years ago, I was really into the raw food meetup groups here in Las Vegas. There's actually a really thriving raw food um, meetup group, or there was back then. I th it's still around today, uh, although I don't, I don't go to it as, as often. But they have um, potlucks every once in a while, or lectures or other events, cooking demos, things like that. And it's it was a really cool way to meet some friends in the raw foodist community, especially when I wanted a lot of social support for staying raw. It was because of joining that group that I was able to go six months raw, whereas before, I think my max was about 45 days. So um, that was really nice. I even hosted a couple of those raw food of potlucks at my house so we get like 30 40 people over and have all these different raw food dishes and it's great just like a you know massive um, uh, abundance of of all this all these different raw foods um, I my specialty is making a raw blueberry pie I I've sometimes I'll make guacamole or other things um, lots of people bring salads so there's usually an overabundance of different types of salads but uh, I have to say the desserts tend to be really popular and uh, um, you know, if, if, if you find a meetup group that's like good for you, then great, keep going, but don't just go to the meetups. Also invite people from the group to hang out, you know, or, or if you're on social media, like friend each other if you can, so you can get more into each other's lives. That's, that's especially helpful. Do something off, you know, off of that, uh, just, just the meetups themselves. Um, I remember when I was in Toastmasters, I met someone there who was a professional speaker and he was like way beyond me in my skills. I think it was my first or second, probably my second year in Toastmasters where I was just starting to think about going pro with this. And um, he, he was a guy who was you know, amazingly talented. He was a performer. He was, he was on stage since he was three years old because his parents were entertainers. And so, and he kicked my ass in a speech contest one time, I remember. <laughs> um, and and uh, so I invited him one time. Um, I knew he needed some help with his website because he was not the most technically skilled. So I said, you know what? Um, you have a pretty basic website. I will um, you know, do like a remake of your website for you for free, which would only take me several hours, it, um, just updating the design and things like that. And in exchange, um, I would love to like sit with you for a couple hours and just pick your brain about, about professional speaking. And he's like, deal. So we met up and I just sat with a notepad and I had all these questions <laughs> I wanted to ask him and I just went down the questions and picked his brain for like two, and a, two, two and a half hours, something like that, and just wrote down all these answers. And it, he probably shaved years off my learning curve there, just sharing all the details of how things work, um, what to do, what not to do. Um, and it was, it was, it was amazing. Um, and that, so that was a lot of value for me, and he got you know an updated website in exchange, which I did you know I did for him. So it was a nice nice little trade. Um, so there's all kinds of opportunities that arise when you you know meet people at clubs and things like that. An extension of this is you can also make great matches by joining a coaching program. Um, I belong to a couple different co um, coaching programs. Um, one's um, one's like forty nine dollars a month, and one's. 12,000 a year, so or 10,000 a year, something like that. Um, and they're, uh, you know, they, they each attract different types of people. And they're online, but one of them has an in-person component too, where we meet, a, meet up a couple times a year. And that's really cool because, uh, you know, it, it allows me to, to connect with people who have similar interests, they want to learn the same thing. So I'm connecting with other people who are trying to learn um, similar things. Like one is about creating membership sites and that's something I'm, I'm working on. So now I'm like connecting with all these people who are either already owning membership sites or creating them. And that is great for just networking and learning from other people. So joining other people's coaching programs, if you think that the program is high quality and it's going to attract like-minded people, that's a great option. In fact, this is one of the reasons I'm creating Conscious Growth Club is to help 
these like-minded people come together in one place. Um, and, you know, having like the right high caliber people, all who are highly motivated, getting a chance to connect with each other. So it provides that social component as a big part of it. So I'm kind of seeing that on, on both sides, both as somebody creating this and both as somebody who's a member of it. In fact, it was, it was being a member of these kinds of groups that encouraged me to want to create my own as well, because I see just how great it is to be able to connect with these like-minded people. Um, online on a daily, uh, you know, on a daily basis, and then by extension, we, you know, hopefully doing something in person too. Uh, a next, a next thing you can do is, uh, and this is, you know, easier for some than others. It depends on your interests. But if you can do something to raise your social profile, put yourself out there more in the world, get a bit more publicity for who you are that can help to attract more people to you. Um, so you, now you have people coming to you instead of you just having to be proactive. So for me, that showed up through blogging and speaking. And I have to say that speaking has been a lot more beneficial than blogging socially. Blogging was good, but what blogging did, and social media as well, it got me a lot of friends all around the world online. Friends that I almost always never see. <laughs> um, so if you, you know, like my personal Facebook page, when I, had, when I was active on Facebook, it was maxed out at 5,000 friends. And then I had, you know, do I really have 5,000 real personal friends though? No, those are friends. You know, people that know you and they send you a friend request and you say yes, even though you don't even know who they are and they connect with you online, but we never see each other in person. And I thought, eh, you know, that's, that's not really the kind of thing I want to have in my life. So. Um, I, I called that back quite a bit by nuking the social media, you know, quitting Twitter, quitting, quit, uh, quitting Facebook. And I, I did recreate a Facebook account last year, but I keep it at zero friends and I have it set to, so that only friends of friends can friend me. So that means since I have zero friends, I have zero friends of friends, so nobody can send me a friend request. And I don't post anything there on my, on my page. Um, it's, I only use it for a networking group that's part of the, one of the coaching programs I use. They have a Facebook group. I wish kind of wish they weren't on Facebook, um, wish they had a private forum instead, but it was, you know, I was paying enough for it, it was, it was worth it for me to just create this account that I could access their, uh, their group, and that's all I use it for. Um, and that's, that's been okay. So, uh, but in general, raising your profile, if you do it carefully, if you do it in the right way, that can bring a lot of cool connections in your life. And again, I say speaking has done a lot more for me there than, uh, than blogging has. Uh, in terms of people I will actually see in person and can create deeper connections with. That means speaking at other people's events, um, doing workshops, just getting into Toastmasters too was great, you know, connecting with other speakers. So that's, that was great for the club reason and also for the actual speaking reason. Because whenever you speak, and like when you do a speech contest, you'll be speaking to multiple club members. Uh, if you get past the club level and go to like area level, division level, district level, and so on. Um, then you speak to other clubs and initially it's still pretty local. So now you've raised your profile because you're like on the stage and you're sharing some seven minute story about your life. And now more people get to know who you are. So you may not know them yet, but many of the ones who see like, Hey, I like this guy and he's a match, you know, I think in some way they'll come up to you afterwards and talk to you and you, know, you might get an invitation or you might want to invite them or you just at least have interesting conversations that way. So that's been, you know, a really great thing. Uh, doing these videos, I imagine, will probably raise my profile in some way with some people. Um, if I had to predict, I would say it'll probably result in me getting recognized in person more. You know, usually because um, my name is pretty famous on the internet because of the popularity of my blog, but a lot of people don't know what I look like. But every once in a while, I do get recognized in public when I'm out. And that's okay, you know, it's, it's fine. I don't have a problem with that at all. Uh, usually, you know, we have a quick chat, maybe take a photo together or something like that. And, and you know, that's about it. Um, or if I'm at a conference, um, I'll get recognized usually a lot, especially if it has something to do with um, internet business or personal growth. <laughs> um, if I go to any kind of conference like that, I'm almost certainly going to get recognized multiple times um, by people at the conference. But I know, you know, just as a as an expectation, if I start doing more videos, then more people are going to know what I look like. And so then it's probably likely if the videos become more popular, you know, because these videos will be online for years, um, then eventually people will start recognizing me in public more. So I kind of accept that. That's a mixed bag. Some people like that. Some people don't. Some people have quit, you know, their social media. I've no, you know, people have taken down their videos because they don't want that kind of thing. Um, I'm okay with it because it sort of ramped up gradually. Uh, 
And that can create some good connections. It depends. You know, you might just have the, the people who just know a little bit about you and they have a quick chat with you and that's it. Um, but it, you know, it's one, it's one of many race, ways to raise your social profile. And I don't have a lot of experience with video yet, so I'm not sure where that will lead. But I do have some friends who have done a lot of video and they, they tend to get recognized in public a lot more than I do. Uh, for, you know, for me, if I'm not going to conferences, um, then outside of that, I might get recognized in public, like, you know, just a few times a year. What was odd is when I was in Bucharest, Romania, um, a few years ago, I got recognized five times in about three and a half weeks in public, and uh, most were people who didn't even know I was in the city. So that was interesting. And I, and I was guessing it's probably because I don't look like I'm from Bucharest. I don't look Romanian. <laughs> so I probably stood out more. Um, and, uh, you know, like I was sitting at Starbucks working on my laptop there, and, I, and somebody recognized me. Um, so that's something to play around with. If you think that it, if you think that it would help, um, you know, great. I remember the actor, uh, I was reading an interview about the actor uh, George Clooney, um, where he was saying that one of the things he liked, or one of the reasons he got into acting, is he hated the idea of approaching women. He didn't like rejection. He didn't like putting his heart out there on a plate, you know, to be squashed by somebody else. And so by raising his profile as an actor and, uh, you know, being perceived as a sexy, attractive uh, actor, women would come to him, of course. And so then he has some degree of abundance in that, in that area. Um, so, you know, that was, that was his strategy. And there's some people who have judgments about this strategy. I see it as part of a holistic, you know, uh, 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 it's part of the big picture. It's um, not necessarily something you want to rely on completely. I do think it really helps to be proactive. There have been years where I've been pretty lazy and I just relied on, you know, having a high profile socially to, to, uh, to lead my social life. And that, that tends to be a bit chaotic and random because then you feel like, yeah, I'm getting a lot of invitations, but it's a lot of stuff I don't necessarily want. And when you want to go down a certain path or have certain people in your life, I think it is more powerful to do your own proactive inviting and not just rest on your laurels because you have a high profile and everybody's coming to you. Uh, that can get out of hand, you know. It, it, it can be like a case of the cart leading the horse where you're getting pulled along by all these invitations you're getting. And, you know, the best word there is no. <laughs> you know, you have to start saying no to that type of stuff. Um, so the final, the final tip I have for you is to live your life as if you already have the social life you desire. A lot of people put the full richness of their lifestyle on hold until they get all the friendships and the relationships they want lined up. And that may never happen if you have that attitude. I think it's much better to just dive into doing what you want to do and living the lifestyle you want to live to the extent you can. And that, that actually will help, attra help to attract more of the right people into your life. So if you see yourself, I would love to travel with friends and things like that. I want a friends that I can travel with. But then you're not traveling, waiting for those friends to show up. I think that's a big mistake. I think you're better off diving in and traveling now as an individual because you often meet friends while you're traveling. You'll meet them on the road. I often make some of the best friends when I'm traveling. And I think one of the reasons is because when I'm doing that, I'm living my desired lifestyle fully. And um, I'm also just in a more exploratory, playful mode where I'm more open to social connections. I'm away from my desk. I'm thinking, um, you know, more open with my, uh, I'm thinking just more openly with my energy. And, um, so we have a fighter jet flying above. Ellis Air Force Base isn't too far away from here. Um, okay, so, you know, the idea here is don't wait. Don't wait to have this amazing social life show up. Go and live your life. Live the life you want to have. That is going to make you a lot more attractive to people than if you're waiting for some kind of relationship or connections to show up in order to empower you to go do those things. Um, you know, do the thing, do those things anyway. Just do them in some small degree, to, you know, wherever degree you can. So, you know, that's, that's kind of a big picture. There's a lot of different ideas here, a lot of different steps here. You can take them individually, use them one by one, or you can use them all together. Um, they're pretty powerful if you use them together. Like being clear about what kinds of connections you want and shamelessly expressing your values, expressing who you are, inviting people, 
to connect with you in different ways, inviting invitations from others, letting them know you want invitations or you're open to receiving invitations in certain areas, um, you know, being directly seeking of meetups and clubs and coaching programs and opportunities, um, conferences where you can connect with these people and meet with them, and raising your social profile, that certainly helps in certain areas, and then of course, just living the life you would live if you already had this, okay? So take action on this. I think the first action step would be to make those two lists. You know, what are the qualities and values of people you want to have in your life as friends? And what are the qualities you don't? And if you have to start culling, that's the next step. Like start getting rid of the stuff that's just not a match for you. Start getting rid of the things that, that are social clutter in your life. One of my friends calls, it, calls them social plankton. Not so politically correct, perhaps, but, you know, I get his point. Um, you want to you wanna connect with those people who are social whales for you and the ones who are going to provide a lot of value for your life and the ones that you can provide a lot of value to as well. And if you hold back on expressing who you are, that value alignment is just not likely to happen. Okay? I'll see you tomorrow.